This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. You are listening to In a City Like Yours, a semi-monthly podcast featuring interesting people with interesting life stories. This podcast may contain language and or subject matter not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I'm your host, Michael G. Moore. Please visit our website at inacitylikeyours.com. That's I-N-A-C-I-T-Y. L-I-K-E-Y-O-U-R-S dot C-O-M for links to our social media, all popular podcast platforms, and links of interest pertaining to all episodes. On this episode, I chat with Jack about his father, Albert Anastasia, who was involved with the crime syndicate Murder, Inc. Jack wrote a book titled Family Legacy, which tells the story of his father's involvement in the Gambino family. Jack was the prize heavyweight boxer fighting George Foreman. He is also an actor who was one of the villains in the Superman movie series. Then, after the break, Carmine tells the story of his youth as a martial arts champion. Like Jack, Carmine is also an actor, appearing in several self-produced martial arts films, including the popular cult classic Face the Wind and multiple award-winning short films. Here are their stories. My name is Jack O'Halloran. I'm in Redondo Beach, California. And um, we're talking about, uh, I've written a book called Family Legacy. And uh, I wrote the book because we felt, uh, myself and some dear friends, felt that it was time that some truth was told about uh, the history of this country. And it's a book that entails the story of New York where my father was a man called Albert Anastasia, who was involved in a little company called Murder, Inc. And he was, um, the Anastasia family turned into the Gambino family. My father was partners with Charlie Luciana and uh, Frank Costello and Meyer Lansky in the beginning of the, of the, of the commission and putting it all together. Uh, they... Um, my father was um, the overseer of the waterfront. His brother Tony uh, ran the waterfront in bequest to him. My father supported it, and um, they uh, controlled everything coming and going. Uh, in 1957, they assassinated my father because he did not want to bring the drugs into America through his ports and he was uh, against the drug business, like a lot of the old timers were. And uh, after they assassinated him, a couple of years later, uh, Meyer Lansky sat me down and said that it was the worst mistake they ever made because he was the glue that held a lot of things together. Uh, I was born in Philadelphia. I was a World War II uh, love affair. My father was, um, when they were looking for him in New York in the 40s, in 1942, he was at Indian Gap, Pennsylvania, in the Army as a sergeant, teaching soldiers how to be uh, longshoremen, which was kind of a joke. But um, And he never spent any time there. He was in Philadelphia every night because of the, the waterfront down there and other business that he had. And that's where he met my mother, and I was a product of that. And uh, I never met him until right before he died. Um, I had a minder around me uh, that uh, he put there that kept a watch on me and uh, taught me a lot of things in my earlier life and prepared me for what I eventually probably might have been wanting to do in my later life. We waited for a period of time to write the book because I waited for certain people to die because I didn't want any harassments or anything and because the book tells a lot of truth. 
about what went on in the country, and I use everyone's real names because I have the right to do that. Uh, we're writing uh, three more books that will come out, and uh, I have several friends of mine across the country that are some of them in their 90s right now that uh, would like to see the truth told before they pass on. The first book that I wrote was from my father's death to Jack Kennedy's death, and I tell the truth about the Kennedy assassination. What we did was we're not looking to, uh, we're making a movie out of the book and a, and a TV series, but we're not doing what they call like a typical mob movie. We're going to tell a story about how the government and uh, the unions and uh, industry and organized crime were all partners for a lot of years up until the 60s when the Kennedys got involved. And the partnership worked very well. I mean, when I was a young boy in Philadelphia being raised, uh, we never locked our front doors. We were, uh, we were children. We played in the streets from sun up to sundown. Uh, there was no drive-by shootings. It was uh, neighborhoods were run and protected and safe uh, in a lot of areas. So that um, just there were so many changes that have happened in our society and, and over the years, and I've watched a lot of it happen. I was involved in, uh, in in a lot of things involving the unions and stuff, and uh, I uh, chose to go into sports as a daytime job, uh, and which worked very well, and uh, boxing and football and boxing, and, and then I uh, got involved in the film industry. And um, so from that, with the books that I'm writing, we're going to make them into some pretty good movies and uh, a television series, I think, that will span for a long period of time because we have a lot of information to put down and, uh, and a lot of stories uh, to put truisms to so that uh, people and there's a lot of people one of the great things about the TV series will be that the age span will be from 100 down to teenagers because they're stories that people have been telling their families all along because they lived in these periods and no one's ever really told the truth and they know it you know, the media tells you what they want you to hear. And, you know, a lot of the stories that are covered over and a lot of things that are not the way they're supposed to be. And uh, I think it's time that, you know, people don't understand is that organized crime in the very beginning, you know, they made their money from gambling, loan sharking and extortion. And if you didn't have money, you couldn't pay them. So they made sure you had jobs. So they took a lot of illicit money and they put it back into the growth of the country. They controlled the waterfronts, they controlled the unions, they controlled, uh, they invested in insurance companies, they invested in General Electric and Westinghouse and Sears and Roebuck, and uh, they put a lot of a lot of revenue stream back into, like I said, the growth of the country. And no one ever talks about that. So it's about time that we told the truth about how some people were thrown under the bus. What was the name of the book again? Family Legacy. You go on the computer to familylegacythenovel.com. It'll take you right to a site uh, that tells all about myself and the book and takes you right to Amazon where it can be purchased at. It's actually quite a, it's actually quite a great read, actually. People, it's a five-star book on Amazon, and uh, I think people find it very interesting. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the, your initial meeting with your father? He uh, came to see me. Uh, actually, it was a really kind of a mind blower. I was playing freshman football at West Catholic High School in Philadelphia, and we played on a on a lot behind. Uh, we played our games on a lot behind uh, the school, and um, which had grandstands in it, and you could see the people who came. It wasn't like the varsity, which I played there as well, but. So I was playing a freshman game, and uh, and these four gentlemen showed up. They were all dressed to the nines, you know, like, like they walked out of Vogue or something. And everybody thought they were scouts or somebody from colleges and stuff. And it was my father and a few people from New York. After the game, he was showed up at my house, and and I had my first discussion with him. And he arranged that we were going to get together and meet. And the following week, and right before that happened, he was uh, he was assassinated. It was in October, 
were his killers ever found or been convicted or anything like that? They were never they were never locked up and they were never convicted, but they were dealt with. So you knew who they were. Yeah, it's, it's, let's just say they were dealt with. You know, it's, uh, we're, you know, there's there's some things that you some th- one of the reasons why the book is the book is uh, I, the character is Jack Pagano, which is a family relative of mine. So you can There's some things that had no statute of limitations. So you have to be very careful what you say about certain things. So yeah, I understand. They were dealt with. They, they believe me, they were dealt with. Why don't you? Tell us a little bit about, you mentioned that the book goes from the death of your father through the Kennedy assassination. So what happened in between that time? Well, they, we go back, it reverts back into the beginning when my father, uh, my father was, my father was put on, uh, he, when he first came into the country, he was illegal when he first came in off the boat. He didn't go through Ellis Island. He, they took him off the boat and they brought him into Brooklyn. And um, he um, he was working down at the waterfront and he killed his first guy in the night. I think he was 20 or 21. And they put him uh, in prison and he was on death row. He was, you know, and he did something for uh, an elderly gentleman while he was in jail. And the gentleman was very close to Charlie Luciana and he said, I think that uh, this young man needs to be looked at. And Charlie got my father um, a new trial and they took him out of out of prison after 18 months and there were no witnesses for the crime that he was being charged with. So they let him go, but they never deported him, which was amazing. And uh, he and Charlie Luciano became very good friends and he worked his way up through the ranks with uh, Joe Pervacci and a whole bunch of people. They all came up at the same time. Uh, Costello and, and Meyer and, and, you know, they were all young men. And then they put together, um, he and uh, Louis Buckholder put together a company called Murder, Inc. And they were the enforcers for organized crime. You know, they, they never killed innocent people. They only took care of business and fled the family. So we, we, we talk about that and we show how the family, how things changed up until my father's death. And when you, if you've seen The Godfather, when they went to Brando for, to get him in the drug business, uh, and Brando said he had to decline because if he touched it or children would touch it, it would be the downfall of the families. Well, my father said that. So the, when we put this thing after, my father's death and uh, some things were starting to unfold and things were put in place and I went on a learning ex- exhibition and uh, went to Sicily and took uh, met some people there and, uh, and I met Charlie Luciano in uh, Naples because he was deported by uh, Dewey and uh, but he was living in Naples so I sat down with him and we discussed a lot of things and uh, and I was going through a learning curve, you know, uh, which uh, I have, you know, I, I was, uh, I'm what you call a, a made individual. I was made when I was 19 years old and um, and I've lived under the code of America all my life. I still live that way. Then we get yeah, down well. into how politics changed in the 60s and how certain things changed and turned around in the banking system and everything else and uh, the election of Jack Kennedy and how he got nominated and how he got elected and uh, why there was so much animosity. And and if you were going to say what one person was responsible for Jack Kennedy's death, it was his father. His father made a lot of enemies in, in the course of his years. He backstabbed a lot of people from the prohibition days all the way up to his son's death. You know, he, uh, he angered a lot of people. You know? And the, the story of, of Joe Kennedy is very vivid, and I know a lot about it, and I uh, uh, know a lot about how he went to Chicago, and they and they had him under thumb, and, and how he progressed, and he was actually in Hollywood. He, they sent him out here and introduced him to Randolph Hearst. He was actually... 
the individual who put uh, the distribution deal together for RKO Studios. Got all the Jewish theater owners to put their theaters together and they formed the distribution deal for because organized crime out of Chicago owned the cinematographer. They actually controlled the film industry for a lot of years. Speaking of the film industry, now this, your book, Family Ties, is being made into a, a movie. How much involvement will you have in that? Are you writing? Are you a- acting in it? Uh, I don't know. I may do a job. I don't know if I'm going to act in it. It's, uh, I'm going to produce it, that's for sure. Um, and I've done my, a lot of the writing, uh, the script and all, because we're, we're staying pretty close to the book. And we're going to uh, end with the first picture will end with the Kennedy assassination, and now I'm going to tell the truth about it. Let's talk a little bit about your history in the film business. Where did you start? And give us some stories about, you know, your life as an actor. Or in, well, I, you know, it, it's amazing. It, it's uh, cross-channeled with boxing. Um, in the 60s, early in, in 1966, 67, I was in Boston. Uh, I started boxing in Philadelphia, and uh, I had uh, a few fights down there, and then I got into a little rhubarb and a street deal, and they shipped me up to Boston to get me out of town so I wouldn't get locked up. And, um, and I embarked on a career in Boston, and, and, and Steve McQueen came to Boston to do a picture called The Thomas Crown Affair. And we looked after him while I was there, and he and I became pretty good friends, and uh, and he said to me, you know, come down on the set. Uh, I'll put you in the movie and you got to come back to Hollywood. And, you know, because he, he and I got on really well. And he was a, he was a, I, I like Steve. Steve was a good guy. And I just, I said, nah, man, I'm undefeated as a heavyweight fighter. And I, and I like what I'm doing. And, you know, so I passed. And then in 1968, I, um, Knocked out a guy, Manuel Ramos, in in L.A., who was ranked number two in the world. So I was looking at a title fight with Muhammad Ali, and uh, uh, they were doing a picture called The Great White Hope with James Earl Jones, which was the biggest picture in Hollywood. And they, uh, through friends of mine from the East Coast, Raymond Patriarch out of New England, they wanted me off the streets, so they, they made a deal with Eddie Foy at Fox to set up for me to do the Jess Willard part in The Great White Hope. And um, I, they flew me out. I was living in New Jersey. They flew me out to California to meet the producer. And, and I sat down and he thought I was just going to come in and sign the documents. And, and he started explaining to me that they, were, they wanted me to go to Spain for six months. And they were going to do this. And they were going to do that. And how much they were paying me and the whole nine yards. And, and uh, Mushi Callahan, who was an old wise guy who was a, a fighter as well, was the special effects guy and the coordinator. And he was all excited and stuff because I could fight. And it would be make the, make the picture coordinating a lot easier. And uh, when I turned them down, I, I said, you know, there's a, a, a white fellow from uh, Minneapolis, James Beatty, who just retired from boxing. He's got six miles to feed and he needs a job. Call him up. And the guy said, you're turning me down. I said, well, I'm not ready to do this yet. So Eddie Foy was all upset because he thought we were going to get in serious trouble from Raymond. And I said, I'll take care of it. And so I passed on it. And I was leaving Fox and I met James Earl Jones. And he, he grabbed me. He said, uh, you're Jack O'Hara? I said, yeah, James Earl Jones. He said, uh, is it true what I just heard? You just told Hollywood to take the biggest movie out here? and stick it. I said, well, if you want to put it in that kind of terms, I, said, I, I turned him down. He said, I got to shake your hand. I never met anybody who's done that before. And then, of course, I got a phone call from a queen. What are you crazy? Ba bang, ba bang, you know, so. But, you know, then I I knew I had a disease called acromegaly, which is a tumor of the pituitary, and I shouldn't have been boxing really at all. But um, in 75, when I retired, they offered me a picture, Farewell, My Lovely, with Robert Mitchum. And I said, well, man, you know what? It's time to take a shot at this. And I came out, they flew me out to Hollywood, and um, I did a screen test, and Mitchum said it's either him or I don't do the movie. So I blame it all on Robert Mitchum. What have you done since? Did uh, We did Farewell, My Lovely, and which turned out very well. And then I did a picture called King Kong with Jessica Lang. 
And then we did uh, March or Die, and we did uh, Superman 1 and Superman 2 and Dragnet and Baltimore Bullet and Hero and the Terror and uh, several other things. So it's, uh, it's been very good, you know. Superman 1 and 2 were huge movies. They sort of made us like uh, film icons, you know. What uh, parts did you play in, in Superman movies? There were three villains that flew around, and I was the big guy that didn't talk. The character non. Fair what my love there, I was I played Moose Malloy. Actually, I it was the first mistake that I actually made in, in the industry. I, uh, Johnny Carson wanted me to do his show, and uh, and he would have gotten me probably. I had a very good chance of getting nominated for supporting actor that year for my first picture, which was and Mitchum for sure thought I would I, it would happen. And, um, so he arranged for me to do the guy Johnny Carson show, and I, I met John at the Polo Lounge in uh, Beverly Hills, and uh, we, we had a good discussion. He, he said, "Boy, I love you to do my show, and if you do my show, I'll get you nominated." And I said, "Then I stopped and thought about it, and I said, your show is live, isn't it?'" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, I don't think I can do it." He said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Well." I'm going to come on your show. You're going to ask me about my father, and I'll ask you where the men's room's at. He said, you'd get up and leave? And I said, yeah. I said, uh, I don't talk about my father, and I don't want other people talking about him. And so he said, oh, well, we'll, we'll ask you. We'll give you a list of questions that we're going to ask you. And I said, you know, no disrespect, John, but you're the biggest investigative reporter in, in, in the world right now. And, uh, and you have Albert Anastasia's son on, the, on your set, and you're not going to ask me about him? I said, you know. And I was foolish. I should have done the show. Because like Mitch said to me the next day, Jack, it's Hollywood. They, who cares? They love that stuff. And, and McQueen, of course, called me up and yelled at me. And uh, I should have actually probably done it. With, uh, and probably would have had a shot at, at being nominated, maybe winning a supporting Oscar that year. But, you know, it's one of the things you just do in life. And so I never looked backwards. And my career certainly didn't suffer. And, you know, I... With doing King Kong, it was it was a big movie, with Jesse Lang's first movie, and and uh, that worked out pretty well. Um, and March or Die, I was going to do March or Die, and they came to me to do the Bond movie. Cubby Broccoli met me at my agent's office, and I didn't like the script, and I didn't want to be cast as that type of a character. And so I, Dick Richards did Farewell My Lovely. He was directing the. The March or Die movie, which was with Gene Hackman and Catherine Deneuve, and a great cast. So I did the March or Die movie, and uh, and then I picked up Superman. So probably worked out better. But Superman was a great film. You mentioned you didn't want to do the Johnny Carson show because you were hesitant to talk about your father, uh, and you said earlier that the only reason you wrote the book now is that you were waiting for individuals to pass away that may be affected by the book was that the only reason or were there others no that was mainly you know uh i i, I loved meyer lansky he was a dear friend and he was an elderly elderly man and uh, i didn't want him to go through any harassments over certain things because we tell the truth about a lot of things you know and um, there were a few people that then i sat down and thought about it and i said you know and I discussed it with him, and I had discussed it with Costello and some people, and they said, you know, go ahead and write it. You know, so um, although some of them passed away, and I finally sat down and, and did do it. And, and then when I did the book, <laughs> when I did the book, they, uh, they, um, I had a, a guy that, that kind of watched my back from NSA, and he, they made a meeting in Hawaii with the FBI and the CIA and the FBI. And the NSA and they, because they didn't want to publish the book. They told me that if I did the book nonfiction, that they would not let me publish it in America because I was telling too much truth. And I said, uh, so we went back and forth and uh, I have a few toys put away that would have divulged some things about some people <laughs> and they weren't too happy about that. So we made a compromise and I said, well, I'll, I'll, we'll do it fractional. I'll put a little bit of fiction in, and they said, that's okay. You confuse people. It's good. So the book's about 80% true and 20% fiction. 
You said you're in the works with two other books. Yeah. Do you have a time frame when the the next uh, one might be released? I think in about uh, three months there'll be a book come out, and then uh, that we're going to bring them back in, in faster sequence. So about three months to four months tops, there'll be the second book, and then uh, the third book will come out like five months after that, and then the the, the next book will be the last one that'll come out uh, probably six months after that. Because we want to, we'll do a film of each one. But we want the television series to run in kind of close at the same time. So, because it's going to be, it's a great. There's so much, there's so much information in reference to the growth of this country, and the interfacing of Europe, and uh, and and and, and the, the stories of of truism that you know the OSS uh, was started by Charlie Luciano and some other people in the government and. Uh, then they went from the OSS to the CIA. And uh, there are stories about China and different things that uh, when, when when people weren't allowed in China and Murder, Inc. went in there and go Sam Giancana was very close to Shanghai Shek. And, uh, and then there was uh, when Joe Kennedy was sent to England to be ambassador, he was told to sit down with some other people over there and the Shah of Iran was a gangster, and they put they put a bank together, and they you know there was a lot of things, and they were closing the gaps up over there. So there's just a lot of interesting things that I think they're truisms that people really need to know. You know, it's like when Jack Kennedy was was running was was up for nomination before he even became you know, before the the election, he was being nominated out in California. And um, H.L. Hunt went uh, with a basket full of money to his father, Joe Kennedy, and, and said, um, you know, for Jackson, for Johnson to run as vice president. And they accepted it. And, uh, and Joe Kennedy was supposed to have had the electoral votes put together. And of course, he didn't. And uh, the second day of the nomination thing, they called Chicago and begged for help. And Giancana said, well, you're supposed to have had all this. He said, well, we need help. And so Illinois, for the very first time, went Democrat, and so did two other states. And, and it got down to the third day, and there was only one state left that really had enough votes to get electoral votes to get him nominated, and that was West Virginia. And we had a bunch of illegal casinos there, so some debt was excused, and uh, West Virginia raised their hand, and Jack Kennedy was nominated. But um, as soon as he was nominated, his father had a lot of control over him. And he, uh, Bobby was supposed to have been sent to Ireland as an ambassador. Instead, he was put as attorney general. And and, um, and then the, the people in Texas that, that helped uh, Jack Kennedy and gave a lot of money for the Johnson thing, um, the oil people, they had what you call surplus oil that they made a lot of money from that they never paid tax on. And Joe Kennedy told his son, he said, you know, you should put a taxation on these people. That tax cost them like $200 million a year, so they weren't very happy about that. And there was a few other things that, uh, that happened that uh, the Bay of Pigs, uh, you know, a lot of people died there that day for no reason, only because Joe Kennedy told his son that the, they didn't need bullets in their guns because there wasn't going to be any action, and a lot of people got killed while they were in the water. And a lot of CIA people got injured, and it was... Um, a lot of animosity floating around. So, you know, some things uh, came to a head at the end of the day. And Jack Kennedy was not going to live out his term. He was dying of four diseases. People don't realize that either. They used to shoot him up every day because of Addison's disease. And Addison's disease is the deterioration of your back, you know, your, your spinal canal. So he was in a lot of pain, Jack. And, and, and I kind of liked him, actually. I knew him and thought he was a great president, actually. I kind of liked him a lot. But his father had a terrible influence over him. All right, everybody on the train, all aboard, you snooze, you lose. Buy my loot box, eh? Not you! Get off the train! Don't let him on. Oh, okay. All right, listen here, Greenhorn. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about how to conduct a podcast. First thing you need to know is never stay on topic, 
ever. Uh, sir? What do you want? Uh, people are complaining about the Venom movie still. I don't care. Feed them Justice League or something. Get them off my back. Copy. But, sir, it says in the book that you need to stay on topic as a podcast. Screw the book, Greenhorn. The book was written by dinosaurs. Second thing you need to know is never report news that's not at least two or three weeks old. Uh, sir? What do you want? People are complaining about the Pokemon Go update. I don't care. Just... Gag them! Or something! Shut them up! On it. Uh, sir? What do you want, Greenhorn? I think the train might be going off the rails. That's exactly how we run this show. This is the Crazy Train of Thought podcast, brought to you by the Idiot Savants. Find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. www.crazytrainofthought.com Hi, my name is Carmine Caradona. Um, uh, my age is 65, yes, and a long and healthy career, I guess. I can tell you a lot of pitfalls. And I'm calling from uh, Amityville, Amityville, Long Island, you know, the home of the, Amity, the Amityville uh, horror movie. So, uh, yeah, it's right down the road from me. I know that they change the they change everything, you know. So everything is probably. I think somebody's living there now, but that's where I'm calling from. Uh, you want to hear the story now? This is a story. That, I'm going to take you from the '70s right now because that's when I started. When I moved out of Queens, Long Island, I, uh, Queens, I moved to Freeport, Long Island in 1970. Uh, in 1970, in high school, they had a theater arts. Uh, program going. So I joined Theater Arts and uh, learned a lot. They taught stage and everything. I met uh, a few celebrities. I met uh, the guy, who, the actor who played Barnabas in uh, that uh, that TV show that they had on. Dark Shadows? Uh, uh, Dark Shadows, yes. He oh, came I love in, that show. Yes, he came and spoke to the class at that time, gave, you know, uh, some inside stories and everything. And uh, and told uh, how they did, because they did it, uh, virtually they did on video at that time. That's what they, they first started out doing uh, those soap opera type things on video. So he, that was like a live video shot that, w- that it was done. So uh, that piqued my interest uh, among, uh, I can go further back in my life, but we'll just go ahead right now. So in the seventies, what happened, uh, I started uh, doing that when I got up out of uh, high school uh, about 1973 I met with some people who were still in high school was in uh, doing camera work and everything so they showed me how to use the camera and they wanted to help me do a movie figured hey let's do a movie right now so since I was in the martial arts from 1970 which I moved to Freeport I figured I'd do a karate movie so we did a movie called face to win uh, there was no sound because we didn't know how to put the sound at that time. But, you know, I put effects into it. It is now on YouTube, Face to Win. It's about 20, 25 minutes long. And that got me a knowledge behind the camera, working the camera and everything. They taught me how to do that. We came out with the first karate movie, which uh, we had like a big uh, thing and people came to it and saw it. So that was my first thing on uh, in a movie making. Then I became a DJ working uh, with music and everything. That was my big love with music. So I became a DJ in about 1975. And I started working clubs as a club DJ, which, uh, you know, at that time I uh, still worked uh, DJ. You had to come up through the ranks. I had to do gigs for nothing in order to get known, build up, build up a following and everything. Then I built up a following and of course, what happened at that time, you started getting a little more famous in the DJ world, and you start meeting different people. At 1978, what happened, I met a, a guy, John Totoro, who was an actor, a big actor right now. He was just starting out, and he did a thing with Raging Bull as an extra at that time. He says, hey, uh, come, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm an extra in Raging Bull. Of course, you go, ah, yeah, right, right, right. That, I met John through his brother, Ralph, who we were good friends with. So I, that's how I met John. And um, now John's a big star. You see how that, that one goes. But then I had a big pitfall in 1978 also was uh, when my mother passed away. 
And that put a big hurt on me. It was hard for me to concentrate. You know, there's always like backfalls and it stops you from doing things. But I still tried to continue, continue as a DJ. But, you know, your, your attitude gets a little out of hand. I started drinking, started heavily drinking at that time. You know, you, you start to lose control. You know, then I, I kind of come back. Things open up and close for you. I met my wife, who I'm still currently married to, going on 40 years. You know, she came to bring me back a little bit. And then after that, you know, uh, training in karate still, that helped a lot. And I moved on to Wing Chun in about 1978 in Chinatown. So I go to Chinatown working on another art, martial arts. And then my father wanted to move down to Florida. So we moved down to Florida and that opened up all the doors in Florida. You know, when I went to Florida, I started another five animal styles. So I continued my martial arts ability, which brought me now to uh, movie making come into Florida at that time, 1983, came out in 1983. I was called, I, I signed up with an agent at that time, Sid Martin, who was an older, older gentleman. And he got me in a film called Blue Skies Again, which I was an extra. You know, now I started out as an extra. So in the 80s, I started to open up the doors. At that time, I met another person who started in his career, Andy Garcia, who traveled from, as he told me, traveled from California on his own dime in order because he got a support act role in that film. So I talked to him for a while and he told me how he, you know, made, was trying to make it and all that which gives you more inspiration about what, you know, what to do. During that time, I got signed up for uh, uh, Miami Vice. I did a, a part in Miami Vice. I met one of the supporting actors, Michael Talbert. And uh, Michael Talbert, you know, uh, he, me and him became good friends because I still was working as a DJ in clubs down in South Florida. So uh, he came to visit me at a few clubs where I was working at. And... Uh, Still going on, uh, working, uh, you know, uh, working as a DJ, plus getting up in the morning. I'd be working until uh, from four o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the morning as a DJ. Then getting up, you had to be on a set seven in the morning. So I was going all day, all night. Hence, going back to doing what everybody does, more drinking, doing uh, occasional drugs, and getting, uh, you know, getting crazy, but still trying to push ahead, you know. So uh, during that time, uh, about ninth, then I did uh, making Mr. Right. I did an extra in that with John Makovich. Moved on. I almost got a part in Scarface, which will you see as uh, things go full circle as we go on. Uh, but they moved that production back to California and they said I could still be in it as an extra, but it wasn't worth going to California as an extra on an extra pay. So I had more responsibilities at home because then my father passed away, which I lost my mother in 78, my father in 1984. Uh, before that, I was lucky to... Uh, be asked because of my martial arts ability to come to uh, do some security work for uh, noted uh, martial artists uh, because they they were I was at a, a function which I knew the person who was throwing the function and he asked me why don't you watch uh, Chuck Norris so I was with Chuck Norris at that time and I did that thing for like a whole day with Chuck Norris and then uh, every year I was called back, but he, Chuck Norris couldn't make it the second year. He was doing Missing in Action too. So I was with uh, Bill Superfoot Wallace, Ed Parker, Bon Suhan, all the you know, noble art martial arts that I did a little security, made sure that nobody was bothering them. Uh, so I did that work over there. My father passed away and I had to take more responsibilities on a house which takes you away from what you were doing it's hard to juggle everything at once i opened up a karate school in about 1986 which only lasted in about to uh 94 because of hurricane andrew came in so hurricane andrew 
Uh, a lot of people had, took the, their kids out of class and I had to make a decision to close down the school. Otherwise, you know, lose a lot of money. Uh, nobody was coming because everybody was rebuilding. So I closed down the school and started teaching privately to a few of my selected students. Uh, as time as time went on, you know, through the 90s, through the 90s, uh, you know, I lost my uh, older brother, uh, Bill, in 1995. So my family was dwindling. It was me, uh, my younger brother left, and my wife at that time. So uh, things to get back to uh, filmmaking, it was hard to do anything at that time because I was, I was working hard as a DJ in order to make ends meet, working a lot of hours. But then, of course, working in that type of uh, field, the drinking goes on. And, and it gets heavier and everything else gets heavier. Uh, you have to uh, try to make a decision, but at that time I couldn't make a decision. My wife uh, suggested uh, we move back up north, up here to Long Island again, after being in Florida for 23 years. Her parents, their uh, health was failing, so uh, she wanted to go back and spend some time with her parents. So. In 2004, I left everything, all the DJ and everything I was doing down in Florida, moved back up north to Oceanside where they were living. And we would reside at their home to look over them. And in 2009, I get more bad, bad news. My younger brother was killed in a car accident. He was run over, which I tried to fight for a year to find out. I think the woman that was driving was on the phone at that time, but there was no laws in Florida at that time for being on a phone. Uh, so what happened was my drinking started getting even more excessive. I mean, you know, depression after depression after depression and not getting anywhere, that's what happens. And then the reality sets in when I got a colon infection and I almost bled to death. I was rushed to the hospital it would just ironically, it happened in 2012. And that was uh, on Palm, Se uh, Palm uh, Sunday weekend. That what I did at that time, uh, I had to make a decision. I was in the, I was in the hospital and they says, you know, if you, you keep on this path, it's not gonna be long before you're gone. I came out of the hospital, I stopped drinking, stopped doing anything on my own i didn't go i maybe you know everybody goes to aa and all that but i chose not to my will took over and since then i haven't done anything i got my health improved then my friends i contacted friends in florida once again and they told me how to get back into the film industry because it has changed and went digital and I had a computer at that time, and I says, well, why don't you do films on, get a camera and do films? So I said, yeah, why not? I try that again. So I went and uh, I tried and and I made a couple of short films and I put them in festivals. Uh, some other friends uh, guided me through how to make it, you know, in the festivals and go through it. and. A couple of my short films hit and won festivals. I started getting more and more known by people and they were saying, you know, I was being contacted by people. And, you know, now I started to, you know, when, when you don't have that cloud over your head with the drinking and everything else and you could think more clearly, everything started to fall into place, doors started to open. And that's where I uh, got called. Then people were saying, maybe you ought to get back into acting. and. You know, I figured out, yeah. so I, I ran into some friends. I, I went to uh, a festival, went to uh, a premiere of a film that I met some friends in. And they says, oh yeah, you know, how you doing, Karma and everything. And they knew a little bit about me and they gave me uh, a call and they says, well, why don't you come into our film? They were making a film. And I says, oh, as an extra, yeah, I mean, and they says, no, we're gonna give you lines now. So now, I go into that to the facet of making uh, a film and being in a film, being in someone's film with actual lines. And I had other lines, you know, which I guess my theater arts from the past helped me to uh, know how to, uh, to deliver the lines and everything. So uh, at that time, uh, 
I said, sure. And I, I, I arrived on, I met some people. I met a, a, another actor that was working with me on the scene that I was in, Albert Gomez, who is in The Irishman that will make its appearance in the New York uh, Festival at the end of September. That's a movie with Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and a lot of other, directed by Martin Sorsese. Uh, so I met him. On this film, it's called The Streets. And uh, there's a lot of up and coming uh, actors in the streets. There's, uh, it's, again, here comes with uh, going full circle. I find out Angel Salazar is in the movie The Streets, which I'm appearing in. And he was in the movie Scarface as Chi Chi. So I didn't meet Angel Salazar yet. I wasn't in any scenes with him, but I know he's in the movie. Also in the movie uh, is uh, uh, Dan Romano, Frank Carrera, Scott McManus, uh, Bella Dimitri. It's a film that is directed by uh, Richard Kern and uh, it's filmed by uh, Eddie uh, Rocky Rivera. And uh, it's produced by Ellen uh, Pligagrano. Um, I don't know if I got the name right on that. But yes, it's a film, The Streets One. It's on Amazon Prime. It's, it's if you want to, anybody wants to look it up, it's called The, and The Streets is with a dollar sign, and then T-R-E-E-T-Z. And that's how it's spelled. And that's how you're going to get it. And then you can watch it. My scene comes later in the film, my uh, character Sal is introduced. Then they decide, let's do a Streets 2. Now, when they came in the Streets 2, they called me and they gave me bigger role, more lines. I worked with uh, uh, other people and that's still not out, that one. So, you know, those are the films that, that now in, in, you know, this year, uh, 2019, that I've been working on and moving ahead, there's another film I'll be working on called Good Friday, which I got a call for from uh, Sal Ranella. Uh, he's doing that film. It's a film by him. Uh, once again, I'll, this time I'll be working directly, I heard, with, uh, with Angel Salazar. Plus, the other actors that I mentioned previously are being called for that movie also. So... We're working on that movie. But remember, you know, a lot of times what happened in my life, a lot of setbacks in my life was people that died in my family and my close-knit family. I like lost my whole family. So now it's me and my wife and, and things can get rough and you gotta rethink things. And sometimes something might happen in your life that, you know, it's going to change it. And what happened with me is I got sick. I was almost on my deathbed. And I had to make a decision at that time. What's go what am I going to do? So in order to clean up everything, a healthy diet, uh, I go to the gym four or five times uh, a week and work out, trying to keep, even at my age, I try and keep myself fit. And that's what everybody should do. That's my story current right now, what I went through. Uh, I'd just like to know what, if if you were to give advice to a person who is just beginning in theater, with your experience, what would be the best advice to get them going? I would say to listen, always listen. Whenever I go, I went to a, a festival seminars, and the best thing to do is to listen and always get knowledge and then come home after that, because that's when that's when the knowledge is fresh in your mind. And go over practice, look up things that you heard, write down as you're at the wherever you're getting the knowledge, write it down. When you get home, look it up, look it up. And with the internet today, you can look up about anything and read behind the lines and how everything goes. Albert Gomez, who's in many of of those. Uh, uh, wise guys type movies of the past and present. When I worked with him on uh, the streets, he said to me, in order to learn lines, and I didn't even notice, and this is what I mean, you never know enough experience. Remember the first two words in the line that you have to say, and it seems like everything comes out afterwards. And when I tried that, when he said, everything came out, and don't worry about saying anything exact. 
when you're saying your lines, because sometimes you have to fit it to what you say. And when I did that, it then it's up to the director to correct you. Luckily, the director I had, uh, Richard Kern, was very easy going. He says, yeah, don't worry about it, Kami. We, we got that covered. You, you did it right, as long as you say it with the right expression and everything. And that's another thing. That's, that's what I learned. 